Hello everyone, this is Garrick Zoder, the clarinet professor at the Shenandoah Conservatory. Uh, today I'm going to lead a little clinic on the Allstate Etude for the B-flat clarinet here, 2019 Etude. Um, and so I hope you will find it helpful. Uh, while you're here, go ahead and subscribe to my YouTube channel. And if you'd like to ask me any questions about the piece, about the etude, about the clarinet in general, you can do so in the comments section. Or you can just send me an email, gzoder at su.edu, and I will answer you as soon as I can. Uh, I hope you find this video instructional and useful for you. And so here we go. So, you've heard me play the piece, and now I'm going to talk a little bit about it, and hopefully the things that I'm going to tell you are going to help you to play the piece uh, as best as you possibly can. Um, so let's take a look at it, yeah? When we look at this piece, we see the tempo indication Allegretto Grazioso. Does everybody know what that means? Well, you're in luck. I'm going to tell you what it means. So, it means light, gracious, and somewhat quick, right? But it's that grazioso part, that lightness, that we really want to focus on in this etude. And one thing we certainly need to do is, rather than thinking of the tempo in 6-8, we need to think of it in 2. So rather than thinking 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, we're going to think 1, 2, 1, 2. And why are we going to do that? We're going to do that because that creates a natural grazioso feel to the music. Rather than making it heavy, one, two, three, four, five, six, we're going to think one, two, one, two. And when we think that way, it gives the music uh, sort of, uh, how should I put it, it, it levitates the music, right? It keeps it up here, nice and light, rather than grounded or sort of dragged down by gravity. So this allegretto grazioso indication is very important in terms of telling you exactly how you're going to play the piece. Okay? So that's a very important part, a very important po uh, point rather, to consider here as you're initially looking at the piece. Um, as I was working on it this morning, uh, in addition to that light feel, I noticed that there are a lot of articulation markings in this piece. Many, 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 right? We have accents, we have staccatos, we have dashes, we have notes that are short, we have notes that are long. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you look at the piece, there's not a single measure that goes by where there isn't something that's articulated or tongued. So this is very, very, very important. And that brings me to something that I can show you in my score uh, that I uh, a little uh, trick that I do in order to make myself pay attention to these things more. Um, when you take a look at this music, when you print it out, right, it's completely black and white, right? And as I was going over it this morning, I noticed that it's very hard to catch all of the indications in the music when all you're looking at is this sort of blur of black and white notes. So it's hard to see all of the accents, see all of the dashes, all the staccato markings. So, how do I help myself see those things? Well, what I do is I use a highlight pen to highlight the different articulation markings or accent markings, dashes, staccatos in the music. So what I've done in this piece, and I'll show you the score in a second, is I have taken a yellow highlighter and marked all of the accents with a yellow highlighter. I've taken a green highlighter and I've marked all of the dash accents, the tenuto markings, with a green highlighter. 
And what does that do? Well, my eye can jump to where I see the highlighted uh, marking. In other words, when I see yellow, I know to play an accent. If I see green, I know to play a dash. That way they jump off the page at me and I can uh, see them and react to them quicker rather than having the page be completely black and white and just seeing this sort of blur of, of markings and not being able to catch them all. Um, additionally, what I've done in this piece is I've taken a red uh, marker and I've indicated uh, the dynamic markings. So I'll show you this score. If you take a look, you can see exactly how I've done that. So you can see the yellow markings for accents and you can see the green markings or green markings where the dashes are. Okay? I find this extremely helpful in indicating where exactly all of these multiple articulation markings are in the piece. Um, and so if, that, if you find that helpful, um, I hope that you will do that. So, once you've got all those articulation markings clearly indicated in your score so that you can really see them as they pop up in the music, you just want to practice the difference between the two, right? So you're going to want to practice your short tonguing for staccato notes, and in this case you're going to want to make them especially short, yes? Um, and then you're going to practice accented notes with a little bit more edge, a little bit more uh, articulation on the front end of the notes so that the notes will pop out more, a uh, little bit more, I don't want to use the word harshly in the context of this grazioso piece, but a little bit more oomph to them, yeah? And then uh, there are also sort of notes that do not have a staccato or a dash or an accent on them, and these are the ones you're going to want to play kind of, I hate to use the word normally, but without a lot of uh, accent or, or shortness to them. Yeah? So you're going to really want to differentiate between notes that are articulated without an accent, staccato or dash, notes that have a staccato, notes that have a dash, and notes that have an accent. This is a rather big part of the piece. Um, and in the performance I did at the beginning of the video, I tried to kind of overemphasize these things. Uh, so that you can hear them. Um, and so that's something you can certainly practice. And, you know, videoing yourself, like I did here this morning, or using your phone to record yourself, and then playing back the recording of you playing these different articulations will allow you to hear if you are actually doing them or not. Um, oftentimes we think we're doing a lot in terms of separating notes, keeping them short, or keeping them accented, or tenuto, uh, but sometimes it doesn't come through as clearly as we think it does. So doing a video of yourself or doing audio recording of yourself is very, very helpful in this regard. Okay? So once you've got all of that down, uh, we're going to take a look at the piece, uh, and we're going to take a look at sort of how to play groups of six eighth notes, which is what we see, for instance, in the very first measure, or groups of 12 sixteenth notes, like we see in measure five, for instance. Um, and the way we're going to do this is we want to always play these passages in a way that gives them direction. So how do we do that? Well, let's look at measure one. When we have six eighth notes in a row, what we really want to do is have the third eighth note of the measure and the sixth eighth note of the measure act as sort of a, a pickup note, so to speak, to the next eighth note. So rather than playing yup ba 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 ba, we're going to play yup ba 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 that way, and that's going to create a nice sort of impetus in the music to move forward and give each measure a lot of direction. Okay, so as you're playing these eighth note patterns, like measure one in this etude, you're going to want to play them that way. So d da ba b da ba ba rather than d da da d da 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 okay? And that's also going to go back to, again, that allegretto grazioso indication, which is so very important to give us the character of the music, right? So practice these eighth note patterns that you have, and often it's two slurs followed by a tongued note uh, in the piece. Use those tongue notes to act as notes that lead into the next uh, eighth note beat. Okay? That's going to be very helpful in terms of giving the piece a really nice musical and well-directed feel. Um, and then, when you have these series of sixteenth notes, such as measure five, you're going to take the uh, 
fourth, fifth, and sixth sixteenth note of each grouping, and you're going to lead in to the next beat. So you're going to play ya pa 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 that way, rather than ya pa 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 pa. Hopefully you can sort of hear the difference, and if you go back to my performance, hopefully you'll hear me doing that. Um, and the idea again is to give direction through those eighth notes and sixteenth notes. It's very very important to give a nice flow to the music. And just as a side note on that, you know, when we're faced with difficult passages in music, and there are a couple difficult passages in this piece, uh, it's very, very, very important that we play with that direction in the line. Because our fingers react to that. And I have found that they react to that in a very, very positive way. So if we're, we're sort of dictating to our fingers, play this way, play with direction, play with a purpose, play in a way that the music is going somewhere, rather than playing in a sort of flat-lined, uh, directionless manner, uh, your fingers are going to be much more accurate as a result of playing in this well-directed way rather than a way that does not have any direction, okay? Um, so this way of playing is not only going to help your phrasing, but it's also going to help your technique in these difficult passages uh, that you find in this piece. For instance, measure 5, uh, measure 21, and measure 7. Uh, particularly are uh, a little bit tricky. Actually, measure 27, also very tricky. Um, so again, try to hear yourself playing with direction. Ba 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 or D da ba bi da ba ba that way, rather than playing with no direction. You will find not only that your phrasing improves, but that also the direction of the music and the musical line will uh, will will work wonderfully as well. Okay. So now, let's go over a few technical issues in the piece, and by technical issues I mean just ones pertaining to uh, the actual movement of the fingers, note accuracy, this type of thing. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, uh, this particular etude this year is not nearly as technically uh, challenging as the one last year was, so there's not as many measures to go over specifically in terms of specific issues, but I will go over a few of them and talk about some of the some of the spots that are of uh, most difficulty. So uh, let's talk about measure four. So as we look at measure four, we need to realize that the G sharp at the end of the measure needs to be in the right hand, and the F needs to be in the left hand, right, in order to therefore get to the right hand E, left hand F sharp, and right hand G sharp in measure five. Now again. Uh, I'm talking about clarinets like mine that does not have the auxiliary key here. If you have the auxiliary key here, you don't necessarily need to follow the plan that I just outlined. But for the majority of you that have a clarinet without the E-flat key, that's the way you're going to want to do uh, the notes in the end of measure four going into uh, measure five. Uh, let's see, the next technical issue pops up in measure 15. Um, and here, again, you just want to make sure that you play the E-flat in the right hand and the C-sharp in the left hand, okay? Uh, now, measure 16. Uh, in, in, in learning the piece this morning, measure 16 sort of annoyed me uh, because the tonality of it makes the measure sound incorrect, uh, at least to my ear. So as you're working on it, just make sure in measure 16 that you are playing the correct notes. Don't let your ear lead you astray. Your ear is going to want you to play a G sharp instead of a G natural in the second half of measure 16. However, it is a G natural, so make sure that you play that. Okay? Um, now, let's take a look at measures 17, 18, and 20. These are the measures that rhythmically are a little bit tricky because the reality is that they're really not in 6-8. They're really in 3-4. So make sure that you count those measures as you go from measure 16, 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, right? Don't count those measures in 6, 8. If you do, you will end up playing the rhythms in 17, 18, uh, 20, and even in measure 30, you will play them a bit incorrectly. So I suggest thinking of those measures in 3, 4, 
rather than 6a. I think that's going to be very helpful. Okay? Um, and I think this is written that way basically to trip you up uh, and to have you uh, play those measures inaccurately, thinking in a beat pattern, which doesn't really work. So just make sure that you go from 6a in measure 16 to 3-4 in measure 17, and in the like passages like that, make sure you do that. Okay? Um, measure 23. We have a little bit of a ritardando there. Uh, I think it's okay perhaps to take a little bit of time between that measure, the end of measure 23, and the beginning of 24. Uh, it allows you to uh, sort of relax the breath a little bit, reset yourself a little bit, and then continue on. Uh, I think that's helpful, and I don't think you're going to have uh, any points taken off for doing that. So if you want to take a little bit of pause between measure 23 and measure 24, I think that's fine. Okay? Uh, and then lastly, uh, another place that might trip you up is measure 24. And why is that? Well, when we take a look at measure 24, it looks very much like the first measure of the piece, right? Uh, in fact, it's exactly the same as the first measure, correct? Maybe not. So take a good look at it, especially the last eighth note of that measure, the last eighth note of measure 24. This time, for whatever reason, it's a G natural. Right? And if you go back and look at measure one, the last eighth note is an E natural. So make sure that you don't play the E natural from before. Um, your ear, because it heard you play that first measure, is going to tell your fingers to play an E at the end of measure 24 instead of a G. So just watch out. Again, these are little pitfalls that I think have been sort of uh, deliberately written into the music to trip you up. So watch out for that. Okay? Um, yeah, so that's pretty much all I have to say about this etude. This one, again, like I said, this year is not such a big challenge as it was last year. I think, again, if we go over the points I've talked about in the video, we're talking about capturing a very light style, thinking of the piece in two rather than in six, um, watching out for those measures that are clearly written in three, four rather than six, eight, um, and then really working on your articulations, making sure you're showing the difference between the accent, the staccato, the dash, and the notes that don't have anything written over them. Um, one little thing about the dynamics, actually, as we close things up here. I didn't mention the dynamics. The dynamic scheme of this piece is rather limited. Um, if you take a look, all we have is mezzo piano, forte, and mezzo forte. That's it. We don't have a lot of dynamics in this, in this, in this, in this piece. So what you're going to want to do is take mezzo piano as your softest dynamic and play it softer than you normally would. That way the judges will hear a really clear difference between your soft playing and the louder forte playing, right? Um, that's pretty important here. There's a lot of mezzo dynamic markings here which are neither loud nor soft, um, and we tend to do those very well. In fact, we tend to do those too much. Um, but that's a whole other story. If you want to hear me talk about that, you come have a lesson with me and we'll, we'll talk about uh, the evils of mezzo forte, so to speak, in clarinet playing. Um, but do make sure when you're playing this etude that you're noticing that, the, that, that, that your softest dynamic here is actually mezzo piano, which in this case is going to translate to piano. Um, and then your loudest dynamic is only a forte, although if we look at Measures like measure 7, we see a high E-flat with an accented forte, so that's going to pop out. Um, and actually, in this case, you do want that to pop out. Okay, so do note that. And, uh, yeah, I think that's, that's all I have to say about the etude for this year. And I wish all of you the best of luck. And, uh, again, anytime you'd like to have a lesson with me, just send me an email, gzoder at su.edu, uh, and I would love to hear you. Okay, good luck. Take care.